Hello, everybody. Hello. Nice people actually responding. Um, so before we start, could I please ask everybody who is able to please just stand up? Yes, forcing you to work. So while you're standing up, can you get up on your tippy toes as high as you can? And now roll your shoulders back. Take a deep breath. And sit back down. Thank you. And that's my talk. Thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, but all jokes aside, it's getting very late. I know you've been stuck here with the terrible air every now and then. Just had food, some cake. It's easy to get tired. So I hope you all at least now have the energy to listen to me for roughly 40 minutes. Uh, so who am I? Uh, my name is Marcus. I work as a DevOps engineer at Noid Cloud in Malmö in Sweden. Uh, I always wanted to be a lawyer growing up, so I actually went to law school. Um, but I decided that it was for me, so I dropped out. And then I went to school for game development instead, uh, after pursuing a failed career in sports. Uh, I actually finished school-ish, didn't get a diploma because physics wasn't my thing. And then I got hired as a DevOps engineer, and that's what I've been doing for the past roughly six years. Uh, I like to say that I'm a nerd because I'm passionate about stuff. So I. Uh, I'm very passionate about teaching and sharing knowledge, so that's why I'm here, and I hope you'll enjoy this. I'm very passionate about martial arts, so I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I've been doing it for roughly 12 years. And I'm super, super into making pizzas right now, so I'm spending a lot of time making Neapolitan-style dough and tomato sauce. So if you're interested, we can talk about that later as well. Uh, uh, more business stuff, I am the leader of the AWS user group in Skjone, together with Jimmy, who is also here today. You maybe listened to him previously. And I am, as of like a few months ago, part of the Community Builder program. And that's a lot of time on me, so let's talk about why we're here. Today we're going to talk about our relationship, how we talk to each other, how we make each other better, and how we can make this work going forward. Um, so there's a, let's, we're going to talk about Blameless, and I know there's a company right now trying to make money off of this, but I want to talk about the culture, the ways of working. And to lay the foundation of this, I'll give a brief history class. So many moons ago, Blameless started in the industrial sector. There's a field called human, I will read now because it's difficult. It's called human factors and system safety. It's about building complex systems to make them fail safe and also how humans interact with these systems. Uh, a key aspect is that we learn from incidents because we will have incidents. Even the great Dr. Werner Vogel says that everything fails all the time. Uh, and in the IT industry, it's fairly common to have post-mortems or root cause analyses whenever stuff happens. So for those of you who don't know, pretty much we get a bunch of people in a room, figure out why something broke, and we try to learn from that. And this is a great thing, and it's very healthy for an organization. But what is not how healthy, however, is that most root cause analysis end up with a human error as the root cause. Uh, and so I messed up. So the solution is I will not mess up again. Uh, and this is not really healthy. The manager yells at me a bit and then we move on. If we step, stop our analysis here, not only are we creating an environment where it's difficult for me to actually try new stuff because I will be afraid of messing up again, perhaps losing my job or just being ostracized from the group. But not only that, I'm also robbing all of you of the opportunity to learn and grow so we together can make better systems and work better. Uh, so what we want is an opportunity to figure out how we actually work. So not what our policies or processes say or what our managers say we should do, how we actually work when something hits the fan. Uh, and there's a really, really good book that I recommend for everybody that is called The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error by Sidney Decker. Uh, and in this book, Decker brings up uh, the traditional view of human error and it is due to human uh, shortcomings. But he argues that errors are not uh, our fault and it's actually something that is uh, natural and inev inevitable when we are working in complex systems. So these, often, these errors are often caused by systemic failures more so than individual shortcomings. And I will talk about that a bit later. But first, let's talk about cheese. In, in safety engineering, there's a concept called the Swiss cheese model. So this picture is um, generously borrowed from James Pearson, James Reason. Uh, the Swiss cheese model is very simplified. The, uh, the act of using several layers of safety and security 
to cover up each other's flaws so that our system becomes as safe as possible. So every layer always has some kind of flaw. Somebody can exploit something, but if we add another layer that covers up that flaw, then hopefully at the end we have a nice cheese where nothing goes through. We want to avoid incidents as much as possible, but they're still going to happen. So we don't over-engineer stuff, but we put in a good effort to make sure stuff is safe. In industries, we're talking we don't want people to go home without their hand, for example. Uh, and so this model was introduced by James Reason in his book, and this is like 30 years ago. And he proposed that he's, all of these errors are always part of a greater systemic failure where a lot of things align at the same time. And that is inevitable, no matter how good you are. Uh, so we want all, as I mentioned, we want our cheese to be whole. Um, so going back to root cause analysis, uh, a lot of people complain that if we, don't, if we don't say it's human error, nobody's responsible. That is not the key. We are always responsible for the actions that we do. And when I make a mistake, it's important that I learn from it and that we all together learn from it. So I will do my best to avoid doing that, but I will also make sure that I share with all of you so that you don't make that mistake again. So when we are working in a blameless fashion though, it's important that it's not just my responsibility, it's all of ours. We have a collective responsibility as an organization to improve. So especially in my case, if I'm new, maybe you should help me explain and understand more so than just be like, stupid intern. That's at least one chuckle. Uh, so if we take a blameless approach to learning from when things go sideways, the questions we need to ask after the why, uh, after the what, is why did I do that? And to get started, we need to agree on some assumptions. And there are just two. Uh, for if we don't agree on these, blameless does not work. And if we don't agree, maybe I don't want to work with you. And you probably should be doing something else. So the first thing is that everybody always wants to do their best at any given time. And we assume that people we are working with are always looking to do the best effort they can at any given situation. And obviously some days are shit. Sorry, I'm not, not yeah. Um, but not every day can be unicorns and donuts. But generally we want people to do their best. And secondly, everyone always makes the best decision that they can in a given situation. So again, we make these choices every day, whether it's walking to the office instead of driving or having that extra slice of pizza because we're, well, we deserve it. Um, but just because we make that decision and believe it to be right in that situation, it is not necessarily right. And that is the important distinction that my perception in that, in, in that specific situation can be flawed. And that's okay. But if we agree that these two assumptions are always correct, then we know that any mistake ever made in our organization is never malicious. It is never on purpose. And if it's never on purpose, then we also know that the people making these decisions are making the best decision they can. So why was I believed to be right wrong? Now we're getting to the heart of the actual matter. This is where we can learn a lot about ourselves and our organization. Uh, so the first one is flawed information. I was stressed, so I messed up. And it's way more common, sorry, yeah, I was misinformed, wrong slides. It is more common than we might think that we are acting on outdated or wrong information. So we are doing our best to alleviate this. We write documentations, we have tests, we have onboarding. So we make sure thing is clear and secure for everybody. And I'm guessing most people in here have seen headlines where companies are blaming their interns for breaking production. Um, but if we then presume that the intern actually did their best, then they did not fail. The organization failed them, and the intern should not be chastised in any way. They should just be helped, right? Um, it's not uncommon to have this very hectic onboarding sessions where we go, okay, this is our stack of papers, please sign all of them. Um, please learn the code base, it's only 12,000 lines. You have by, by noon and there's all these tools. And then you also have to fit in with the culture at the company, right? And preferably be productive by yesterday. Um, and that is a great foundation for stress. Uh, 
Meanwhile, organizations are super trusting. Everybody gets full access to production. And don't get me wrong, giving everybody access to production with their code is great, because if we, we feel that we can do that, we trust our processes, we believe that everything is in place to have a safe environment where we can just go, and if something breaks, we can solve that. Uh, so I think it's a great thing to do, but it's very dangerous if we have flawed information. So we have all been that overwhelmed new hire one day, right? Whether it's your new job out of school or if you're just changing jobs after 50 years in the industry. Plus not 50, but after a while at least. So when you are new, it is practically impossible to understand these complex architectures that we're working with today. So even your minor changes can have cascading failures somewhere down the road that you do not understand because sprawling systems. Uh, and this is even hard for like those of you who have been working way longer than I have. <clears throat> so the issue with flawed information is more common with new hires, of course, because they're not familiar with the systems. But it's not just for new hires or juniors, it's also senior people who build stuff. So you can have an engineer who built a system, and then six months later, he's been on a different project, comes back to help out. He's in a meeting with management where they go, how does the system work? He lays it out, super confident, and he's wrong, because he hasn't kept up to date. So there's an, another issue where people are not always aware that they are missing information, because they're so confident in what they've done already. But if we're struggling with flawed information, who has the responsibility? The simple answer here is always the organization. Okay, there's always this lazy person who shouldn't be working here, but if we have that person, there's a different problem in the organization that we hire somebody who is not reliable, who is not ethical. But if we still assume that everybody's doing their best, it is the organization's fault. And if our employees are misinformed, then we need to review our onboarding activities, our knowledge sharing activities. How do we work with documentation? How do we mentor new people? How do we mentor senior people? Uh, and how do we make sure everybody's up to date with the system we actually interact with? Uh, so it allows us to review our onboarding activities and knowledge sharing, as I mentioned. <clears throat> and then we have, nobody told me. Uh, so during onboarding, this is from my life, but during my first assignment, I just got access to the repo and they told me to fix something. And the implication was that this was to be for a test environment, but I broke production because the API keys work for both environments. And this is not necessarily the worst case, but it's very common for CI CD systems to always be hooked up to whatever version control you're, wor you're working with. And then suddenly everybody at Starbucks knows your name. God damn it, nobody. Okay. So like two weeks ago, there was this guy at Starbucks called Steve who pu pushed out tests to everybody in the US purchasing coffee. I was hoping this would be fun. Uh, <laughs> That was fun at least, yes. Um, so we don't know what happened here, but it's fairly simple to assume that Steve didn't want to do this. So there was an error somewhere with perhaps understanding which environment he was working with, what credentials he was using. And developers are lazy. Um, I can say that because I used to be one. Um, so we need to make it easy for lazy people to do the right things. Um, so when we put trust in our staff and we give them these accesses, it's important that we educate them as well. So make sure there are plenty of safety harnesses along the way. We want to make it easy to do the right thing. And now we get back to what I almost said before, stress. It's the most common problem we have, and it, everybody in this industry has been stressed. If you haven't, welcome to your first day. Um, so with all product, there are deadlines. Somebody's always getting sick. Somebody has kids that need to get picked up for some reason and all these other things in our wonderful life. And it is impossible to take all of these things into account when you're planning your work, right? But if we are always making poor decisions because we are stressed, then we, the organization needs to address this. So for example, what does the current workload look like? Um, I'm a consultant and it's very, we will have like hours we need to build, right? So is everybody actually just working as much as they are? I have friends working 60 plus hours a week, but they're only reporting 40 hours because that's the work week in Sweden. Uh, but they need to make deadlines. And managers don't like overtime because overtime is expensive. So one concern here is that these hard workers are perhaps scared of not delivering because you don't want to be 
regarded as a poor performer. So you're doing these, you're working these long nights and you're not telling anybody just so you know that you're delivering. But on the other hand, you also have managers who expect you to deliver this because you say this is 40 hour work week, so this is what I expect from you. And if you're not delivering that, that is wrong. How can I help you? But even worse, they don't know that this person is burning themselves out. So we need to be frank with our managers and explain that this is how things actually is. And it can be very difficult to have discussions with management regarding aggressive deadlines, goals, commitments to customers. Everybody's seen these web comics where, yes, we'll have the, the, the feature out by tomorrow. And that is never the case. So when we're looking at large organizations, primarily it's not uncommon for people at the top of the chain to have no idea how we actually build quality systems. Uh, and things take time, sometimes more time than we want or wish. And when deadlines aren't met, they yell at their middle management, who keeps yelling at tech leads, who yells at developers, who yells at, I don't know, a broom closet. Uh, and this is not very helpful because it creates a very stressful environment. Uh, so how can we create a blameless culture where people don't hide in a broom closet? And there are very, two very important things that we need to have in place for it to work. Uh, first, we need psychological safety. Does everybody know what that means? Because then I can skip two slides. Okay, no. Um, so basically, it means that we feel confident in expressing ourselves, whether it's in a good way or, or in a negative manner towards the way we, we work. So we want to say, I don't understand. This is weird. You are mean. All of these things is relevant feedback to a place where I want to work. If somebody's mean to me, we need to fix it. If I don't understand something, I cannot be productive. And I have to be unafraid of retaliation from management or anybody else actually. So if, if I'm being ostracized from my small team, that, that's not helpful. We need to feel safe letting people around us know that we make mistakes so we don't hide incidents or problems so they don't end up in crashing production and losing us millions, but they're actually just a part of our regular working days. We need to have a place where we can grow and share information together. Uh, and it's important to be, when you are expressing these kinds of things, it still needs to come from a place of wanting to grow. You're not complaining, because complaining is not useful. Raising concerns is very useful. So, and for management, it's very important to not take it as a personal attack. It's a desire for me to help them help me, so we can together make more money for the company and I can afford a new boat. And this can only happen when there is actual mutual trust and respect between everybody who is communicating. So psychological safety has not, as far as I know, been proven, but at least it's very strongly linked to a better workplace, healthier people. Uh, not only that, it means we have increased creativity and innovation and problem solving. It also means we have healthier uh, staff in general. And if people working are healthier, and more creative, they will create a better system which will be more efficient and will save the company money or make them money or both. Uh, and also, they are less prone to be sick, which means they're at work and they're not disrupting the efforts because replacing somebody because they're burned out is not very trivial, at least as soon as they have more than five minutes of experience because they usually have something that we need. Uh, and then, <coughs> most important, people won't leave. If you're at a place where you like being and you're respected and you grow, you're staying. And a key thing to actually building something over time is to retaining the skilled people working on it. And the second things we need in place is open-minded staff. You need to be fine with not always being right. That is something I, for example, struggle with growing up as part of four siblings. It's important to you know, make your mark. But it's okay to not know everything, and this is why we are usually larger teams. And it's okay to make mistakes, because you can fix them. Uh, so when somebody tells me that I made a mistake, I can either, either take it as a personal attack and go on the defensive, or I can actually listen to it, take a step back, and see how I can use it to improve. And for management, this is even more, more important, because they're actually making the policies that we need to follow. <clears throat> And we are looking, for this, we are looking to focus on systemic areas, 
So the problems were with our actual system. And usually as individual contributors, we don't make the policies. We just need to enact them. So we need to tell management what works for us and how we should improve. And it's also important to keep in mind that things change all the time. So policies that were made a while back, they were possibly great five years ago, but they're not as good today. So we need to actually be agile in more, more than just slogans. We need to have it and also outside of our tech team. HR needs to improve. Um, I don't know other teams. Everybody part of the organization at least needs to help and grow. <clears throat> so as management, it is important to always walk the walk and not just talk to talk. So I'm pushing this a while, but a lot of managers tell you to, yes, please make sure you respect work-life balance, but then they also say, we have deadlines, so I expect you in the office until we're done. Uh, and this is pretty much like parenting. They do, do as you do, not as you say. And developers are the exact same. Uh, and if we want our employees to admit when they are struggling, managers need to make it accessible. They need to make sure that, no, it, it's 5 o'clock, I'm going home, we'll fix this on Monday, it's fine. And when we have someone open up, do not ridicule or belittle them, actually listen to them and make them feel seen and heard. And then if it's something that is at least general, try to act on it so it's not a problem for people who are perhaps not yet comfortable speaking up. Uh, so yeah, most people do talk about work-life balance, uh, being well rested, but then we also have managers who brag about sleeping in the office. There was this exec at Twitter just a week while back who got fired after she bragged about sleeping at the office. At least she actually did walk the walk, right? She slept at the office with her developers. So that's better than nothing. But you really don't want to do that. Uh, and deadlines, just to be clear, are just like budgets. They're guesses. They are not real in any way, shape, or form. Um, so they should be treated as such. We should do our best to make, meet them. But if we, think, if we find out that that's not the case, then we need to be agile and actually revise them. And CFOs will kill me, but it's true. And we should, so when we take this into account, personal health is always more important than business success. And I will say it again, just to be very, very clear, personal health is the most important thing. Re nothing beats it. Because if you, you're dead, you will be replaced. So the company will be fine, but you won't. Uh, so since I studied game development, um, there was, there's a very famous studio in Malmö, which is Massive Studios, which is part of Ubisoft, made fancy games. That's where I wanted to work. Um, and, and I have friends working there who are t have told me about crunch. Does anybody know what crunch is? Some people are looking resigned. For those of you who don't know, it's the time leading up to develop to release of a game. Usually three to six months, depending on the scale, where you pretty much live in the office. It's at least 12 hour work days every day. Every day. And it's a very lot, and it's not paid because it's expected of you, because you will get a bonus if the game does well. And it's seen as a badge of honor to sleep at the office, eat at the office, never leave. And yeah, that, that's not a good thing. So if you're at that kind of place, please speak up. I know, for example, King in Stockholm and Shark Mob in Malmo has very strict rules on this. I don't think this is being recorded. Let's not talk about this. <laughs> uh, and the rest of this chat was about this Twitter exec that I already spoke. Okay. But pretty much, if this happens, we need to be a mature organization and listen to our staff because we want them to be around for the next game or the next version of the system. Um, so I will do a practical example from one of the postmortems I had a while back. Um, and if you prefer to call them learning from incidents, sure, great. Same thing, different name. Um, you're working for a large e-commerce company. You're selling the latest and greatest in mountaineering gear for babies. So this is a booming market, if you don't know. And you're always recruiting new people across all functions. Uh, so on the ride home from work, your phone is suddenly trying to leave the atmosphere. Managers are calling. Your team leader is upset. Something broke. Um, customers are being charged. But there are no orders coming in, and so we are getting a ton of money. Customers are not getting anything, and we don't have any idea why. So we'll fast forward to the morning, just because the rest will take a very long time. 
Um, but the morning after, you're being summoned into this big conference room with everybody. And you have the CEO, he's very upset. Let's have a post-mortem. How can this happen? We need somebody to blame. Um, fairly quickly, the senior staff lays out a very nice series of events. This is when we found out there was a problem. This is how we fixed it. Everybody's happy. Uh, but management is not happy because we just told them what happened and how to fix it. There's nobody to blame. Somebody must be the root cause because things don't happen by accident. So after some shuffling, general awkwardness, someone pulls up a terminal and runs. Git blame. And lo and behold, it's Bob. Always Bob. Um, so the, clear, the logs clearly point out that Bob made the changes that broke production. So in root cause analysis, we can stop here. This is de facto human error. One person did something, something broke. But management is not satisfied. There's a clear scapegoat. And this does not result in Bob, in Bob getting fired because we're nice people. But he will be singled out in a group of his peers that he is messing up. This will de usually devastate his self-esteem. But not only are we affecting the self-esteem, because some people don't care about that, but we're also telling everybody else, if you take risks, or if you innovate, or if you do something, we will find you, and we will let you know. So instead, remain inside this tiny little box and never, ever do anything except what management tells you to. And this is unfortunately very, very common in root cause analysis. We find the culprit, we chastise them, and then we tell them not to mess up next time, or else. And I don't know about you, but being in that room did not feel good, even though I wasn't the one singled out. Uh, I would not like to be that kind of person. Uh, and being junior as I was at that time, I was not comfortable speaking up. So for those of you who have been around longer, it's a bit on your shoulders to actually be the ones to say like, Maybe we should do something that doesn't mess this person up for the rest of their career. And just as a side note, something you can do to tell if the culture is good at a company, lunch the day after an incident. When people are, are making fun of Bob, is he laughing along? If he's not, we are not joking about a problem we had at work. We are making fun of somebody. And there is a very, very large distinction, and one of them is toxic. If you can't figure it out, we can chat later. Um, so, but if we stop here, we don't know everything. So if we instead are in an organization where we embrace the blameless way of working, let's figure out why Bob did that. Could we just ask him? Of course we could. So if we follow the assumption that he always does what is best, then we need to understand the situation he was in, so why that, why that decision made sense. So for example, it is possible that Bob was aware that this change would break production, but he was told by a manager to do it anyway because it's better to make the deadline and have a problem and then fix it afterwards than be late and have issues. And if that is the case, Git blame does not show this, right? Because it, it doesn't show what happens outside of the actual commit. And these are generally important circumstances to take into account. So why does the manager say this? Is he now the human error? Of course. But it's also not helpful, because we need to understand why the manager said this. And eventually, we will keep poking in the chain until we end up at the actual problem. So this could be something very hard, like a policy that says deadlines are not recommendations, which means it's 5 o'clock push. And then you have to do that, right, because that, those are the rules. Or it's a much more intangible, something like in official hierarchies, you are more senior to me, so you told me you can do it, we'll fix it later, and I don't feel comfortable saying, but this will be stupid. And all of these things are things we need to understand as an organization, right? So how can we improve this so that we deliver software with these policies in change? Because if we believe that deadlines are definitive, then we need to review how we work to make sure the team can actually make the deadlines in a manner that does not compromise quality or the staff. Preferably not in that order. Um, and how can we do that? We could, for example, work a DevOps way. We could compromise our tasks, uh, compress our tasks, make them smaller, easier to work on, so we can always deliver smaller batches of value more often. And smaller tasks are easier to estimate. 
And with that being said, estimates are just that. So they're just like budgets, they're just guesses. But when they're smaller, it's, there's a smaller margin of error where we can mess up our guesses. And hopefully they're also easier to build. And this allows the, value, uh, the teams to actually roll faster and deliver value faster to clients. If that is not a solution, we can always invest in training our staff. What if we are working on a subject matter not everybody's comfortable with? There's always possibility of inviting experts, for example. And we, if we can increase productivity, we can still use the same 40 hours and deliver more value. Uh, but so what if Bob pushed code and he had no idea that it was bad? He actually thought this was an improvement. Well, then there are plenty of areas we can all grow together. So we should definitely revise our CI CD pipelines. What kind of safeguards do we have in place for our mature organization? Do we have tests? Do we have monitoring? Is there rollbacks in place in case of emergencies? What kind of databases, backups do we have? All of these are things a mature organization should have in place. And a lot of organizations at least claim to have them. And these are the kind of incidents where we figure out that we actually don't. And that's okay, but we need to take this into account and just learn from it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but not only that, we can also decide to look into how we share information. Our documentation could be stale or it's hard to find. Information needs to be up to date and it needs to be easily accessible. If I just tell you to go, go look on Confluence, you'll find it. And then you need to dive around for a few hours and then you find a page. And then you actually, oh, this is the solution to my problem. And then you do all the steps to find out that this is outdated. It's not working. So you've spent a lot of time doing nothing, pretty much. So make sure your information is always up to date. If, there's, if you can't keep it up to date, you have too much documentation. So you need to find a good way of keeping it easily digestible and accessible. And this goes back a bit to the, the previous slide as well. Maybe Bob just needs additional help. And there are tons of ways to help in an organization. We can have mentorship programs where more experienced people have workshops or mentoring sessions with less experienced people. And please notice that I said experienced and not junior, senior, because there are people who've been working for two years that can help people who've been working for 20 years because the two-year-old has been working with a specific tool, super focused for two years, so they understand this very well. And everybody should be able to learn from this person. It's not, I've, I've been here the longest, so I will, I will be the, ah, the most important person in the discussion. Uh, so it's important to keep this open mind where we can learn from everybody. Uh, some organizations don't have leeway for mentorship programs. Well, then you can always do stuff like Lunch and Learn, because that is actually my favored way of learning weird stuff. And for those of you who don't know, Lunch and Learn is where one or more people talk and the rest eat. Uh, and it's generally something everybody likes to do. Um, and it's a very easy thing to implement. It doesn't have to be formal where we have everybody in, a, in an auditorium. I have prepared slides, I have rehearsed. It can literally be, I saw something cool on Twitter last night, looked at something, and you're talking for 10 minutes. And it doesn't have to be every second week. At my previous company, what we did was we had every X week, two to three people talk for 10 minutes about something. And by making it something and not something techy, everybody could actually be a part of it. So we had people all across, we had HR, we had business support, we had recruiting and we had te technical staff. Everybody had something they wanted to talk about. And some people talked about quantum computing and some people talked about coffee. So it doesn't even have to be something that you find useful. It's just information and it creates a space where people feel safe to share knowledge. It's also a great forum for those of you who want to be here but are not yet comfortable being here. So you can do it in a safe space at your company talking a little bit about something and you don't have to spend weeks preparing. It's actually fairly accessible. And as I mentioned before, you can always bring in uh, experts for workshops if there is a particular topic you are interested in. Almost done. Um, so starting out, I mentioned that we need to figure out how to talk to each other. And this goes in all parts of life. But today, it's, uh, we'll refer to how we talk in the IT business and with the, how we interact with the people around us. 
So generally, we tend to judge other people by their actions, but ourselves by our intent. So that person was an asshole because he raised his hand while he overtook me, but he was actually just being nice, saying thank you for letting me pass. We don't know, but we always assume the worst of people. Uh, so this usually leads to people getting upset over, to be honest, nothing more than brain ghosts. That is what Google Translate told me Janspöken means. So, but, so I would like to assume, uh, circle back to the assumptions we made previously, that everybody doing their best, then every interaction we have uh, goes to serve both of us. So when you work in a diverse workplace, there will inevitably be culture clashes. But these clashes are great because that opens our mind and allows us to see how different people work. So some people are very, very straightforward, very frank. Other people are Swedish and go around the bush as much as possible. Um, but we need to work on actually communicating in a clear manner. So say what you mean so people don't have to guess. That way people will not be upset. And when we make it easier for the recipients to understand, we also make it easier for them to tell us, I do not understand, what did you, why did you say it like this, I, I'm upset, or I don't feel that this is the right way. But it is important to make, to make sure that this feedback or any information given is always coming from the sincere place. I touched upon it before, but it's very important that we are always trying to help when we give feedback. If we're not, keep it to yourself because it's not worthwhile. And when somebody's giving you feedback, take it from a stance where they're trying to help me and not attack me. That way, we can both improve. Uh, so almost last slide. Um, the main critic, uh, critique I get around Blameless is that it's a pipe dream. Um, it could never work in a real workplace. It's all, all often brought up that we are just tiptoeing around the fact that I messed up. We don't want to hurt my feelings. But that is not the case. It's not about absolving me of responsibility. I know I messed up, and we should all make sure that I don't do it again. But if we just hammer me down, we are not helping the organization to improve. Uh, it's, the, the goal is to show that it's OK to make mistakes. It is OK to be wrong. Uh, we all need to understand it so we can express ourselves and improve. And then it's brought up that management is just labeling everything because it's the new cool thing. So everybody was agile, now everybody's DevOps, and then DevSecOps, and every whatever long title that will get you best pay. Um, they will still retaliate when you bring something up. And if that is the case, that is not a blameless problem. That is management not doing their job. They're just selling something. If they're actually working in a blameless way, they will not retaliate when you are giving them feedback. Uh, so we don't want people to hide mistakes and we don't want them to hide incidents because they're afraid that management will strike down upon them with great vengeance and furious anger. Uh, that is the best way I figured to end this. If I can't do a Samuel Jackson voice, so this is what you'll have to do. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>